An inspector calls has been on the GCSE curriculum for as long as I can remember, but how did people respond when the play premiered in the UK in 1946? In today's video we'll look at the earliest critics' reviews. I've worked in conjunction with the Special Collections Archivist at Bradford Library, who's provided me with images from a scrapbook of reviews which J.B. Priestley himself put together. Now I'm not suggesting that you'd quote or even refer to these critics in the exam. My aim for this video is to look at the initial critical responses to the play and to discuss whether they've held the test of time. Would we agree with them today? So what we're going to do is this. I'm going to read through each of the sources, which will make this a long video, but what I'll also do is include timestamps in the comments section, so those of you who want can skip the reading of each article and just get to the analysis of each source. By the way, here's the original program on the screen. Pretty impressive, from 1946. So source one is Stephen Potter's review for The New Statesman, and let's get into it. It was a shock, after enjoying the play at the new theatre up to the hilt, to find that I ought not to have been so pleased with it after all. A friend told me it was all politics, a critic that Ralph Richardson was the mouthpiece of the author, somebody else that it was a pity that for this occasion Mr Priestley had changed down to low gear and was grinding away again in the North Country accent. It was Dr Johnson himself who said that it is impossible to write poetically of surges and druggets. But surely it was wise of Mr Priestley, standing as he does here in the stupendous context of Shakespeare and Sophocles, to keep this side of Jordan and give us a simple and straightforward example of the beautiful craftsmanship that in hands like his the contemporary dramatist can offer. And surely it was the critic and not Mr Priestley who was being politically minded when he dissected the play into the brutal modern manner by splitting it into left and right. Sentiments are expressed, it is true. One by one, members of a family are made to realise that they have been responsible for the death by suicide of a member of their own community. Not even interdependent independence can make sufficient allowance for the less fortunate. By setting the play very precisely in the early 1910s, with Basil Dean producing in his best realistic vein, the contemporary moral is kept at a distance. On the wallpaper, prophetically coloured dark red with the congealed blood of future walls, the pictures of well-fed cattle peer symbolically through mists. In Act One, the dining room table fills the stage. In the rest of the play, when the interest centres on another part of the room, the table is set back and a hideous fireplace emerges into view. Otherwise, the set and the dramatis personae remain unaltered, and the play holds us completely. Indeed, at the end of the second act, the characters are tied so immovably into their straitjackets that there seems to be nothing more to be done. Nevertheless, in Act 3, the chords are unpicked one by one, only to be crushed together again in one suffocating grip by the best coup de théâtre of the year. The play is acted with equal precision and professional grace. Mr Richardson, as the mysterious inspector, somehow suggests the unearthly by his very ordinariness, Lucase non lucendo. Only the character of the remorseless father is drawn flatter than life, so that we expect in the programme to find him personified under some such name as Tycoonus, if not Cher do well or Mr Busyman Hardhead. OK, so two things jump out at me here. The first is the way in which Potter refuses to accept that the play is political. His friend told him it was all politics, but here we see that Potter states it was the critic and not Mr Priestley who was being politically minded when he dissected the play into the brutal modern manner by splitting it into left and right. Now this is a very surprising opinion, and not one we would probably agree with today. In fact, I put this quote on Twitter, asking people to tell me which quotes they would choose to show just how political the play is, and many of the examples given were from Mr Burling, calling Gould probably a socialist would be my choice, talking about the need to keep labour costs down was suggested, incorrectly asserting that the Germans don't want war, and the list goes on. So I think we can safely say that we wouldn't agree with Potter on this point about the play not being political. Why not put a comment in the comments section on whether you agree or disagree with Potter here, and crucially give a quotation or reference from the text to back up your answer. The second point of note that Potter makes here is where he refers to Mr Burling as drawn flatter than life. He's calling Burling a one-dimensional character, one who has no depth and who doesn't change or grow as the play progresses. And here's a point we probably would agree with. 
Burling is an out-and-out -out villain in the play. It's so in your face, so lacking in subtlety. Within the first ten minutes of the play, we have the dramatic irony about the Titanic being absolutely unsinkable, and Burling's comment that the Germans don't want war makes him out to be a ridiculous character. And of course, that never changes. Unlike Sheila and Eric, Mr. Burling never progresses or evolves as the play goes on, and so we would agree with Potter here. But is there a purpose behind the decision to paint Burling in such simplistic terms? In my top set analysis video, I point out how one of the challenges with an inspector calls is that it can seem overly simplistic, but there are many hidden complexities in the play. However, not many, if any, of these complexities centre on the character of Mr. Burling. So why paint a shallow, one-dimensional character? Well, perhaps it's because Mr. Burling is a foil to the character of Inspector Ghoul. A foil is a character who contrasts with another to highlight qualities of that other character. So maybe Burling is one-dimensional because he's simply a foil to Ghoul, used to highlight the good qualities of the Inspector. Ghoul is definitely the mouthpiece of Priestley in the play. He's the one who's given all of the key messages in his dialogue, so maybe Priestley wanted to keep Burling's character simple so that the main focus would be on the inspector. On screen, taken from my character analysis video on Ghoul, are just some of the deeper meaningful quotes from this character. You can see that the inspector certainly isn't drawn flatter than life, but perhaps we'd agree that Mr. Burling is. Again, put your thoughts in the comments section. However, it's not just the character of Mr. Burling who the critics deemed as being oversimplistic. In this second and third sources, which we'll look at together, we see reviewers who felt the whole play lacked subtlety. Let's look at these together. A review from The Times and an extract from Rex Pogson's 1947 book, J.B. Priestley and the Theatre. An inspector calls, Bang, bang, Mr. Priestley lets drive with both barrels. If the purse-proud individualists who overlook their responsibilities to the rest of the human family are not brought down on the plane of realism, they can hardly hope to escape him on the plane of fantasy. It is the long arm of coincidence which trains the first barrel. All the members of the same cosy family group are shown to have contributed to the suicide of an unfortunate girl. Each recognises the photograph produced by an inspector with a fine turn of moral indignation. This was the ardent young striker Mr. Burling dismissed from the works some years ago. This was the pretty shop assistant who later lost her place because Sheila was in a bad temper. This was the woman Sheila's betrothed made his mistress and abandoned, and who later fell to the heavy drinking Eric. And it was the same unmarried mother to whom Mrs. Burling petulantly refused relief. When all the confessions have been pieced together, there is general consternation, but some are alarmed as they contemplate a great scandal, and some are deeply shocked by a sudden sense of sin. It is at this point that Mr. Priestley brings the second barrel to bear. The inspector is gone, and they realise that he gave them no chance of knowing whether they were all thinking of the same girl. May it not all have been a hoax in extremely bad taste? It begins to look like that, but the author has still his final curtain in hand, and those who imagine that Mr. Burling and his wife are to be allowed to laugh the experience off have reckoned without the crack of that second barrel. They must have also forgotten the exquisite skill with which Mr. Ralph Richardson has struck in his inspector a balance between the mundane and the celestial. He has given accomplished support by Miss Marion Spencer as the lady whose manners are better than her heart, and by Mr. Alec Guinness as the young rip of genuine sensibility. Miss Margaret Layton is very competently the hard young woman who discovers a conscience, and Mr. Julian Mitchell admirably poses and fumes as the comfortable alderman whose ease of mind Mr. Priestley is intent on disturbing. Mr. Basil Dean produces expertly a play which, ingenious and entertaining as it is, seems oddly chosen to represent the author of Eden End in classical repertory. And the next source from Rex Pogson, I'll talk about both of these after I've read through this. The family is that of the Burlings, whose daughter's engagement is being celebrated when the curtain rises. They are a prosperous family and not unaware of the fact and of the social importance it has bestowed. Burling Pear expects a knighthood quite soon, and then Inspector Ghoul arrives. He wishes to ask some questions about a girl who's committed suicide, his questions cause discomfort to each of the five. Shown a picture of the girl, father recognises her as a girl he had dismissed for seeking a rise in salary. The daughter, Stella, now notice everybody that's a mistake, that should be Sheila of course, has caused the same girl to lose employment in a shop by making a complaint. Stella's fiancé admits that the girl had been his mistress. Mother has refused her help from a charity when she was expecting a child. Young Burling is the father of the expected child. 
Having thus demolished the Burling's smugness, the inspector departs. Subsequently, the chief constable assures them that there is no ghoul among his inspectors, and they realise they've been hoaxed. Is all well with the Burlings, then? It is not. The final curtain is ready to fall when we learn that a girl has just been brought to the infirmary. She is dying, and it is suicide. At first sight, you may say, here is another flagrant case of piling on the agony. Has not Priestley, chasing his belief that we are members of one another, extended the long arm of coincidence to breaking point? And I'm actually going to pause there because there's a reference to Theatre Newsletter, which we'll actually look at in a second ourselves. So both sources essentially say the same thing. This second one we just looked at says that it's a flagrant case of piling on the agony. And, of course, what we would pick out from here, yes, there's the identification of the themes. We are members of one another, as the critic puts it, very similar to the lines of Inspector Gould, we are members of one body. But this idea of a lack of subtlety, piling on the agony, is what we saw also in the first source with Bang Bang, Mr. Priestley Let's Drive with Both Barrels. And that again points out the lack of subtlety. So what both critics are saying is that the play is over the top, it's like you're being preached at. It's in your face. It's impossible to ignore the message that is coming at you. And there are certainly some elements of the play that fit into that category. You'd have to say the message behind the play is impossible to miss, and no one would come away without grasping that the key message is one of the need for social responsibility. However, I don't think the play is all as in your face as it may first appear. As I explored in my top set analysis video, there are subtleties in there too. To start with, there's Priestley's inversion of generic expectations. An Inspector Calls is a work of detective fiction, and Inspector Gould is the intelligent detective who is brought in to solve the case. However, whilst a traditional detective story focuses on the narrowing down from a list of numerous suspects to just one, Inspector Gould does the opposite, and shows that not one but all are responsible for the death of Eva Smith. This is a pretty sophisticated technique to invert the generic expectations of detective fiction to get across this idea of social responsibility. And other subtleties I go into in my animated videos, they include how Sheila starts to mirror and in many ways takes on the role of Inspector Gould himself after his exit. I explore that in my animated analysis of Sheila. And Priestley's use of anadiplosis too, which is covered in my analysis of Inspector Ghoul. So whilst the message of the play is communicated with both barrels, it is communicated in a very in-your-face way, there are also some more complex, subtle ways which perhaps a first-night critic would miss, especially given the fact that they would not have the text in front of them when writing their review. Now we're going to move on to four more sources. They all say similar things, so I'm going to read through all four, and then I'm going to look at the key points from each. And as I said, I'll put the timestamps down below in the comments section, so if you don't want to read along through all four with me, that's fine. But I do think you'll find them interesting if you've got the time to watch the whole video. So, Inspector at the Vic by John Allen, and let's see. I welcome the production of Priestley's new play in Inspector Calls because its success is the result of brilliant work by author, cast, and producer. Richardson's performance as the Inspector is peerless. Margaret Layton, Marianne Spencer, and Alec Guinness have all potentially the calibre of stardom, particularly the latter, and in concert they supply already some of the quality of great acting that we've come to expect from Olivier and Richardson. It is to such admirable players as these that the directors must look for the future stability of their company. It is excellent that Basil Dean should be welcomed back to the theatre in such honourable circumstances. We all have reason to regret the nature of his association with the NSA, but this should not blind one to his association over many years with a fine list of original and brilliantly achieved productions. His work in this case is as fine as ever. To an exquisitely written script he has supplied those thrumming harmonies which raise a naturalistic text to the intensity of poetry, and in this he has been helped by the brilliant decor of Kathleen Anker's. Priestley has been as excellently served as he deserves to be, which is to say a very great deal. I must admit to finding Priestley a tantalising dramatist to assess. Many of his plays have for me an overpowering banality. Facility, I know, is unfashionable, but he seems sometimes to underrate the theatre and to refuse his plays the rich quality of humanity with which so often he invests his novels. And yet, more than any other living dramatist, he has searched consistently for theatrical forms that would offer him a wider range of expression than that permitted by the naturalistic convention. Constantly I wish to applaud his courage, yet I am overwhelmed by the triteness of his pen in contrast to the poetry of his ideas. 
Music at Night was one of his plays in which I was aware of this disparity most acutely. When I read the disparaging remarks he's lately made in certain journals upon the larger-than-life dialogue of Sean O'Casey, I wish that his own pen would sometimes go a little mad and run away with his urbanity and staid good sense and reveal, instead of simply displaying, characters. He has written in Inspector Calls in a naturalistic manner, but it is a morality, and he has raised it with the aid of the producer and the actors above the level of the teacup drama by the most subtle intensity in writing that he has achieved since Dangerous Corner, a masterpiece which in several details of construction it resembles closely. I am a little shocked at the cursory treatment it's received at the hands of the press. I seem to remember that the eminent critic of the Radical Daily, which I happen to patronise, found the play enthralling but with little meaning. I must confess that I have yet to see a play that shows more succinctly or in such telling manner an example of man's inhumanity to man. If ever a play was of the time, it is this. Priestley's play shows just how far, in fact, we are involved in mankind and the measure of our responsibility for the tolling of the bell for the suicide of the dispossessed. Yet do not let me suggest that this play is a tract in dramatic form. It is a superbly theatrical play that does honour to all who have been associated with its first production. The next one is Vernon Noble. Theme that human relationship is one and indivisible, possibly appealed to the Russians. Anyway, this play, which had its first British performance last night, has already been given in most large theatres in Russia. It is Mr J. B. Priestley's 25th and will eventually reach America and London. None of us can make a move without affecting our neighbours, says Mr Priestley. Our lives are intertwined. Into a quiet engagement celebration in an English middle-class household steps Ralph Richardson as a police inspector. He tells of a girl's suicide, shows how each member of the family has had a hand in it. We are respectable citizens, not criminals, explains father. But not only are he, his wife, daughter, son and daughter's fiancé shown to be enemies of society, but most members of the audience probably indulged in self-examination. And here's another one. Any man's death diminishes me, said the poet Dunn because I am involved in mankind. It is a woman's death in an inspector calls, but J.B. Priestley's theme is the same, the common responsibility of man for man. We are members one of another. This first modern play to be included in the Old Vic repertory at the New Theatre has two great virtues. It is about something real and universal and lasting, and it is shaped with the sure skill of the genuine theatre craftsman. The inspector calls when a rich family of 1912 is at dinner, he is investigating a girl's suicide. Stepping well outside any policeman's function, he probes and quizzes till he has brought home some degree of responsibility to all five of the diners. They are fairly ragged individuals when he has finished with them. He goes and they begin to wonder, was he a policeman at all? Was there really such a girl? But right to the ingenious end, Mr Priestley insists it doesn't matter. Their guilt is real enough. Some will say the play cheats, that Priestley should be more explicit, less admonitory. I can make these charges too, but only mildly, for I am content to have been held so closely, stimulated, teased, suspended. Ralph Richardson dominates it all with quiet authority, and Alec Guinness and Margaret Leighton give performances which would make stars of them if the old Vic were not, mercifully, uninterested in star-making. And the final one before we get into the analysis, this is from Theatre Newsletter, 19th of October 1946. Although Mr Priestley's play was first produced in Moscow, it is a play for the new Old Vic audience, not the old one. It is a morality play, not for the folk, but the, for their betters, for the educated or semi-educated, the prosperous or would-be prosperous audience that crowds the new theatre today. Our oldest and in some ways still our best English play, Every Man, is a morality play, and Mr Priestley is in a great tradition so that his play deserves a stage otherwise devoted to Shakespeare and the classic drama. His technique is his own, I have no space at the moment in which to discuss it, but the play is written with masterly grasp of dramatic essentials. There are no unnecessary characters and no unproductive situations. We are presented with five people having a nice little family celebration. The date is 1912 and the place Brumley, or shall we say rich, comfortable, slummy Bradford. The head of the house is a well-off manufacturer and his daughter has become engaged to the son of an otherwise successful industrialist. Everyone is very happy. There calls a police inspector making inquiries, he says, arising out of the death at the local infirmary of a girl who had that day committed suicide. The question he asks, to which he insists on getting answers, implicate every one of those present in the girl's fate. The head of the house who once employed and sacked her, the daughter who had had her dismissed for rudeness from a situation in a shop, 
the daughter's fiancé who had discarded her as a mistress, the mother who as chairwoman of the local charity organisation had refused her help because she did not like her despite the fact that she was going to have a child, and the son of the house who was the father of the coming child. Regarded as a true story from life, it is improbable, but Mr Priestley makes the incidents convincing because they are appropriate. Anyhow, that is the story, and the important thing is the dramatic use he makes of it. He creates dramatic tension, the tension arising from the upset to the happy family party, the threatened wrecking of respectability and the destruction of self-satisfaction, and he imagines the situation so strongly and clearly that our attention is held and our sympathy aroused. We see ourselves in these people, and our hearts are rent with pity and with conviction of sin. The dramatist's aim is to show how our lives are intertwined and how damnable is the doctrine of everyone for himself. Of course, the play is not so simple as I've made out. It seems when the inspector is gone that he is unknown to the local police and that no girl has died of suicide at the infirmary. So, it seems everything is all right. Respectability has been preserved, and although everything that has been confessed is true, they can go on pretending. Well, well, what a lot of bother about nothing. But stop. In the last line of the play, we learn that a dying girl has just been brought into the infirmary under the circumstances that the inspector has described. I do not say that the play has no weaknesses, for the delay in telephoning to the infirmary when the inspector leaves is difficult to understand, but on the whole it is extremely well contrived and is Mr Priestley's best play in this kind up to date. It is admirably acted. Ralph Richardson as the inspector gives a performance in which the magical qualities as an actor that he possesses in such abundance are fully engaged. The part looks very easy, but there are not many actors on the stage who could play it as Mr Richardson does. He does not merely exploit his own personality, he acts with all of the control, discipline, concentration and dynamic power of an actor of the highest rank. Mr Richardson has ecstasy, which so few actors possess today, warmth, excess of energy and largeness of heart that delight us. As he stands and looks at these guilty people with accusing glance, his eye embraces them with more than mere condemnation, and he looks at each one of them with a different expression. Note his poise as he stands and his walk. It was a performance of which I could never tire. Okay, so now let's have a look at some analysis of all four of these sources. So in all four sources we see a common thread. They identify the theme as man's inhumanity to man. That's the first source. The idea of the theme that human relationship is one and indivisible. That was the second source, and something else in the third one, which we'll come back to in a second. The theme being the common responsibility of man for man. And finally, in theatre newsletter, the theme being how our lives are intertwined and how damnable is the doctrine of everyone for himself. Now, like our opening source, none of these reviews explicitly mention politics, but they all say the same thing, that the play is about what today we might refer to as social responsibility, the idea that we should all be looking out for one another. And what is the effect of this message? I thought this was really interesting. Vernon Noble pointed it out in this second quote at the bottom here. The effect of this play is that the audience is involved in self-examination. Every review agrees that there is a challenge to the audience, a challenge which perhaps isn't subtle, but it's a challenge nonetheless. Whether you label it as political or not, the audience is challenged by the message of the play and surely cannot leave without thinking about how the message of an inspector calls applies to their own lives. Well, I hope you found this video useful and interesting. In the next video in the series, we'll continue to look at more old reviews, in particular looking at how they assess the character of Inspector Gould. On screen, you'll see some links to other videos related to this one, some of the videos I've referred to throughout today. And if you did enjoy the video, please do give it a thumbs up.